Welcome, and thanks for joining the Closed End Fund Association for another discussion. Today, we will hear from an industry expert who shares insight on a timely issue affecting the closed end fund space. Today, we're taking a look at Interval Funds, an investment structure that lives under the closed end fund umbrella. To familiarize our listeners with today's experts, I'll provide a quick introduction before turning things over to today's moderator, Jeremy Held. Jeremy Held began his career at Alps in 1996 and has held a variety of leadership roles at the firm over the past two decades. In 2007, he helped launch the firm's asset management division, which has grown to over $17 billion in assets under management. Jeremy is currently responsible for manager selection, product development, and business strategy for Alps Advisors. Joining Jeremy Held are Jeremy Goff, Managing Director at Tortoise, and Brody Bro, who serves as Managing Director for SF Investments. Jeremy Goff joined Tortoise in 2011 and currently oversees the firm's direct lending business and is a member of the Direct Lending Investment Committee. He has also led the development and launch of Tortoise's Interval, Index, and Exchange Traded Fund Business, Clean Energy Initiatives, and as well as its private fund vehicle platform. Brody Bro is Managing Director of Investment Management at FS Investments, where he leads the firm's institutional group. As a key member of the investment management team, he collaborates with management and fund development contingents to ensure the firm's investment offerings are aligned with the interests of the institutional advisors and their clients. So with everyone now acquainted with one another, I'd like to go ahead and turn things over to you, Jeremy Held. But if you could start by telling us a bit more about your experience with Interval Funds, it'd be great if you highlighted why you wanted to join today's discussion. Jeremy? Yeah, thanks a lot, Libby, and thanks for having me on this podcast. So at Alps, we really approach interval funds from from one of two different perspectives. So we are an asset manager, which I'll speak about in a second, but we're also uh, one of the largest service providers to interval funds. We have a sister company that has about 400 different investment management clients where we provide fund administration and back office services. And we got involved in providing those same services to the interval fund industry several years back and we've uh, we've been happy to see that space grow over time from the asset management perspective we are looking at interval funds and hopefully looking to launch two to four interval funds in the next 12 to 18 months and the benefit that we see in the interval fund space is it really captures the best of both worlds from a liquidity and exposure perspective and i think you know we're interested in, in joining this conversation and, and we're involved in the interval fund space to begin with because we do think it gives investors a unique opportunity to get exposure to private assets that would be difficult to get otherwise, but also with a much better liquidity profile. So we're excited about the, the space. We think it has a lot of benefit for investors, and uh, we look forward to seeing it grow. With that in mind, I'd like to hear from an investing expert who's lately spent a lot of time in the interval fund universe. Jeremy Goff, can you explain how an interval fund differs from the more familiar mutual fund and closed-end fund structures? Thanks, Jeremy. Sure. Happy to share my views on that. Um, I, you know, really the way I view it is that interval funds are a great blend of the traditional closed in fund that Tortoise is used to managing along with the traditional mutual fund that we also have managed in the past and still do. So compared to other registered fund structures, you know, they're obviously less liquid than a mutual fund, a traditional closed in fund, but they're great for more longer term investors that aren't looking to, to need liquidity quite as often. And so from our fund's perspective, you can subscribe daily. You only have the option to redeem at certain periods, and you know, it's typically between 5 and 25% on a quarterly basis. I think from a liquidity standpoint, obviously this is nice for folks that aren't qualified purchasers that aren't getting exposure to traditional private funds in the limited partnership structure. They can get access to alternatives through this interval fund structure uh, where you couldn't get those liquid assets into a traditional mutual fund. So it's great from that perspective. Yeah, I think those are a couple of great points, Jeremy. And I think as investors look at their universe of different options, they right now, you know, outside of the interval fund structure, they really have a binary choice where they can look at a series of strategies that may offer them daily liquidity, or they have a whole host of other private strategies that they either may not be eligible to purchase or offer up, in, in many cases, pretty onerous lockup restrictions. And, and, and that interval fund structure really combining the best of both vehicles gives exposure and access. And I think that um, you, you hit on those points well. Brody, from your perspective, where are you seeing interest in this structure and what do you think is generating that interest? Yeah, I think the, the interest we see everywhere. So 
whether it be independent broker channel, wirehouses, RIAs, you know, the traditional retail investor, I think it's a great solve for filling out that alternative bucket. So as advisors and their clients get more sophisticated and people start realizing that a 60-40 portfolio might not be ideal, one of the best ways we feel to access alternatives, obviously specific to the asset class, is the interval fund structure. And allowing you to have thinly traded or private securities that are non-correlated streams of return, you can access them better and some would argue more safely because of their liquidity aspects in this structure. Yeah, we would agree with that, Brody. And I think that investors for a long time have tried to solve this alternative investment question where they have their traditional investments with stocks and bonds. and They're looking for things that aren't as correlated as you mentioned. And the liquid alternative craze that took over sort of post-financial crisis did have some benefit. But I think when you look at what alternatives – what interval funds are able to offer, you really can put true alternative assets in this structure. And I think that that's a real benefit because I think some investors did get turned off by alternatives. They see be uh, better diversification benefits but didn't. And when you look at the kind of assets you can put inside of an interval fund structure, they really do offer those correlation benefits. And so, Jeremy, from your perspective, what investment strategies are available in the interval fund structure and what areas do you see developing going forward? I think anything where you're trying to tie in illiquid assets into a strategy, you know, I think for most people using interval fund structure, you're using it because you want to provide whatever strategy you have to the masses and not just to one segment of the market, like qualified purchasers or family offices. I mean, you really want to bring what you're doing to the broader retail crowd and, and the mass affluence. So from that perspective, being able to put whether or not it's middle market private equity, or we look at renewable energy, or um, we look at social infrastructure, which would be housing assets, senior living assets, education assets, things of that nature, where we're buying and holding those assets for the long term. And whether or not you're clipping a coupon from a fixed income standpoint, or you're just looking for value creation and price appreciation, either way, it makes a lot of sense. And I think in some cases, liquidity, and I, I would argue in the current market, liquidity is kind of overvalued a little bit. And I think sacrificing a little bit of liquidity to get access to these certain assets is very attractive. And the interval fund provides that the right level of liquidity for folks that, that should be investing in these sorts of things. Yeah, that's a great point. And I guess to, thinking about those different types of assets that you mentioned, and I, and I would pose this you know, back to you, Jeremy, and also to Brody. I mean, in theory, should investors be thinking about anything that is in a private asset form or is illiquid today could, in theory, be eligible for an interval fund structure? So should they be thinking about interval funds as the potential new way to get access to private assets? I guess I'll, I'll ask that to both of you guys. Yeah, I can start, Brody. I think that is an accurate way to look at it from the way we see it. I would think the beauty of an interval fund versus even a limited partnership that has a defined term is that it's perpetual in nature, and you can even stick longer lived assets than you would in a traditional private equity or, or private limited partnership. So I think the universe of what can go in there would be extremely broad, and I'd be interested in, in Brody's opinion on that. I think it makes a ton of sense, and I think there's a lot of private assets that can be accessed, and I think interval funds are one of many limited liquidity structures that make sense. They seem to have been adopted, so it's an industry trend. You know, you're looking at north of $22 billion, so typically the market coalesces around a structure. I think you're going to find more and more adoption of different asset classes within it. And Brody, along that adoption line, they have really grown quite a bit in assets over the last several years. And how do you see them fitting into an investor's portfolio? And who do you think are the most suitable investors? There's a handful of investors that have been early adopters of the space. Are those the same investors you think will propel the interval fund space going forward? Or do you think that it's going to be a different type of investor that will adopt this structure as it grows? Well, I really think it's both. I think what you're going to find, and we've already seen a little bit of this, is RIAs or higher-end IRAs or even family offices that want to replicate their exposures from their LPs can use it as a tool to get sort of the accredited universe into their book. So I think that's a big area of growth for the asset class. I also think there's a big educational lift. I mean, we talk about liquidity and liquidity equals risk to some people. And the reality is if you look at daily liquid mutual funds that even if it's not a non-correlated stream return, if it's just fixed income, those structures just aren't ideal for carrying fixed income or anything sort of 
any sort of contract like that. And I think that the point I'm making is that you could take traditional assets in certain senses, I would argue fixed income, putting them in an interval fund actually in some senses makes them safer. You don't have a forced selling issue. You don't have the retail clients, you know, you're not managing to flows. And, and if that's the case, then you can take a longer term view and you can take a fixed income, you know, any sort of contract like that to maturity, which is going to be critical. You saw it in the case of like Third Avenue, not bad managers, bad structure. So I think the interval fund solves for two things. One, private assets, thinly traded securities, but also you can make the argument on less liquid, sort of high yield fixed income or different sorts of CLOs, that, that makes a ton of sense in that structure too. So I think you'll find adoption in traditional assets. I think you'll find adoption in higher end sort of RIAs. And I think there'll be a, a new investor class that'll come up as we you know, sort of have this educational lift uh, across the industry. Great points, and I think the investor behavior one is a really important one because the, I think the initial obvious benefit is that the liquidity of the wrapper matches the liquidity of the underlying, and so the ability to put private assets in this structure makes a lot of sense. But in terms of just allowing fund managers to do what they do best and not having them manage to shareholder flows, but actually have them manage to the opportunities that are out there in the market, I think is going to be uh, – a big benefit that investors get in the interval fund space going forward. So, Jeremy, CIFA has started an initiative to provide information on interval funds. Uh, how available is the information right now, and what sources should financial advisors be looking at and investors? What do they have at their disposal? I think folks like CIFA are, are doing a great job of spreading the word and educating investors. I know we spend a particularly large amount of time, even you know the folks that are out marketing our products, spend a lot of time just educating folks on what an interval fund is. And I think if you look at some of the larger interval fund managers, some of the folks have been doing for a while, I mean, they're the best resources for what these things are. You know, they tend to publish papers on the structure itself and why it's why it's useful. So, you know, I would look to folks that are managing those funds, their websites and things of that nature for, as, are a good resource. Thanks for that information. And it's definitely a space that's, that's moving a lot. I know we talked about it being north of $20 billion, and that, that number seems to be changing on a, on a weekly and monthly basis. What concluding remarks do you guys have? I'll start with you, Brody, in terms of just what investors should be thinking about in terms of the benefits of, of, of the interval fund structure and then you know how it might apply and be used in portfolios. So I'll start with you, Brody. Yeah, I think investors are probably more importantly advisors and how they're presenting to investors obviously need to outline – the asset class or the structure, I should say, you know, can be bought with a symbol at many different financial institutions. So we need to do a good job of educating the end client on the limited liquidity and why the limited liquidity. So to my point before, you know, why would we be in a structure like this? Are we accessing non-correlated streams of return? Are we thinly traded securities, private assets that are acting non-correlated as a diversified? So I think it falls upon all of us in the asset management industry to educate and help FAs educate. And then I think the structure will take on even greater adoption. To Jeremy's point, we spend a tremendous amount of time, and you could find this stuff on our website, on white papers and the benefits of sort of illiquidity, which would fall in this bucket. And I think it does fall upon all of us in the industry to do that. And that will just help the asset or the structure grow. Jeremy, what, what would you say to respond to that? I honestly would probably just echo a lot of what Brody said. I think that paying attention to what the structure is and understanding the underlying liquidity of the assets in the structure and why the structure itself has limited liquidity, particularly in the more retail market, I think there tends to be this negative connotation associated with illiquidity. And the fact is, is that there are huge benefits to illiquid investments even done so in a more um, what I'll call moderate way through the interval fund structure that investors should be aware of. And I just don't think they are in a, in a quality way all the time. And so that education is, is extremely important. At Alps, we 100% agree with that too. And you know, we were fortunate enough to be early on in the uh, advancement and proliferation of ETFs a little over 20 years ago. And we really look at what's happening with the interval fund structure as really democratizing exposure to a broad range of investors to private assets in the way that ETFs really democratized some of that exposure 20 years ago to different asset classes that investors didn't have on the liquid side. And the ability for investors now to, to look at the universe of potential products and say, we want exposure 
to a certain asset class and not be limited by structure, I think is really going to be liberating for investors. It's going to allow advisors to help them build better portfolios. And so we see this um, space solving a big need for advisors and investors, and, and we're looking forward to watching it grow. Well, Jeremy, thanks for moderating. And I also want to thank today's speakers for discussing what's becoming an increasingly interesting place in the investment space. Just having listened in, I would certainly agree that interval funds are a really exciting opportunity for today's investor. So we're looking forward to seeing where things go in that space. Thank you for joining us. We hope you will stop by again for news on this ever-changing space. Until next time, connect with us on Twitter at at CEF Association or by searching for the Closed End Fund Association on LinkedIn and YouTube. 